Hello everyone, I'm coming to you today with a story that even I don't believe. I can't uh, understand how someone like myself who's been studying this subject for more than 50 years could fall prey to it myself. And the reason I'm telling this story is to make sure that all of you out there understand the importance and the dangers associated with pulmonary emboli. Now let's begin by talking about a tragic situation. There was a lady with a 42-year-old, who was a 42-year-old female athlete who ruptured her Achilles tendon chasing someone trying to steal her son's bicycle. Normally she ran three to five miles on most days. She underwent successful surgical repair several days later and was placed in a cast with plantar flexion. She returned to work two weeks later and noticed slight shortness of breath on exertion using the crutches and thought it was due to her being out of shape because normally she'd been running and now she's not doing that. And also she was a little bit anxious and she attributed that to going back to work. She consulted her health care team who agreed and told her not to worry. As a matter of fact, they gave her a small dose of a tranquilizer to sort of settle her, her, her down. Unfortunately, four days later, she suddenly died while attending her daughter's high school graduation. What a nightmare. Her family and her healthcare team were shocked. Autopsy revealed a massive pulmonary embolus along with smaller emboli that had been present for a period of days. Her surgeon had never seen a fatality from this procedure in his practice, and he was shocked that such a low-risk procedure could be associated with a fatality. Examination of the legs at autopsy, however, revealed remnants of clots in her operated leg. Apparently, her mild shortness of breath reflected small pulmonary emboli breaking off from the leg, clots that likely developed after her surgery. The fact that she was in good condition enabled the cardiovascular system to compensate for these smaller thrombi. And this will become important later in my own story. When the large clot broke off and traveled to her lungs, the circulation was blocked, and that's what led to her sudden demise. This clinical presentation reflecting pulmonary emboli with minimal signs and symptoms are typically seen and often ignored. Many times, no clinical warning signs are present, and the first symptom is cardiac ar ar arrest. As a matter of fact, John Height uh, surveyed the Olmsted County uh, database of patients and found that over 100,000 people uh, in a given year presented with sudden death due to a pulmonary embolus. Now, this patient underwent a simple surgical procedure that's not thought to be associated with a high risk of thrombosis. Unfortunately, she was at high risk for developing a thrombotic event, not due to the operation, but due to the baggage she brought to the operating table. That has to be remembered. Age over 40, BMI of over 25, birth control pills, leg cast, non-weight-bearing extremity, and surgery resulted in a Caprini score of eight. I believe that aspirin or another anticoagulant prophylaxis after surgery may have prevented this fatality. She still may have gotten the clot, but I don't think she would have died. A blood clot forming in the leg can break off and travel to the lungs, blocking the circulation. Here we see a, a, the, the scenario on the left. You see a blood clot uh, which can travel from the leg up uh, through the vena cava and go through the heart and get blocked in the, in the lung circulation. And the following is some examples of various size uh, thrombi. Now here's a, a CAT scan showing a small pulmonary embolus. Here's another smaller, or large, slightly larger pulmonary embolus. These could have occurred at different times. And here's a relatively large clot uh, that was uh, also observed. Now, the leading cause of death from fatal PE postoperatively can be prevented. How? There is the fatal clot, and when this blocks both of the arteries like that, then the patient's going to die. Now, how can it be prevented with a thorough risk assessment? And we advise using the Caprini score and also prescribing anticoagulants based on the present patient's level of risk. We have plenty of data showing that if we give the right patients anticoagulation for the right period of time, they can be saved. Unfortunately, PE mortality has increased over, over the past decade. Now, we know that individual risk assessment is vital to providing optimal thrombosis prophylaxis. 
treating everyone with the same anticoagulant strategy just, just doesn't make sense because the risk of thrombosis varies widely between individuals. The Caprini score we use because it's a 40 element history and physical. It was developed in conjunction with a lot of people brighter than I am, and I wound up with my name on it being at the right place at the right time. But it's a very good history and physical. And as we know, as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of thrombosis increases. We know that risk factors have different powers, some low power, some high power, and bed rest is low power, cancer of the esophagus is high power. Depending on the power and the number of factors, we come up with a score. And the score goes up in proportion to the incidence of venous thromboembolism. And now it's been studied in over 230 patients and 5 million patients worldwide. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is capturing all, all 40 elements in the score is a time consuming process. So use the patient friendly version. When you go to the dentist, you have to fill out your, your health history. Why not when you go to your surgeon? But what's more important than that is not to wait until something happens. You need to sit down right now after you hear this presentation, huddle with your loved ones in the family to find out their complete score, thorough evaluating risk factors, family history of thrombosis, obstetrical complications. These are all powerful things that are often missed. Then take that score and you can download it free from my website. We don't keep any information, by the way. Take that score to your family physician, get it verified, get it put in your record. And then when something happens, bingo, you've got your risk already sitting there uh, without the danger of missing any of those important factors. Here's what the score looks like. And we know that this is really important as complications in women. When, and that's, they can have a complication during their childbearing years, but that complication can result in a blood clot factor that will cause them to be at high risk for thrombosis the rest of their life in some cases. So you've got to know that history, no matter how old the patient is, to make sure you do that blood test and calculate their risk. By the same token, family history. Family history, there's only two risk scores in, in, that I know of that track family history. And one is the British score from the Department of, of, uh, of Health in Britain. And the other one is our score. And that score in Britain has also been shown to lower the incidence of fatalities for 15% over a two year period when the score was mandated. Now, when I said before, how, do we, how can we prevent most fatal clots? Well, here is one study among the vast amount of literature available. This was 23,000 patients and they got low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin to see which would be better in preventing fatal clots. And the outcome was fatal pulmonary emboli adjudicated at autopsy. And you can see here a tenth of a percent in either group. So if you got heparin or low molecular weight heparin for the right period of time, which was seven to 20 days, then the chance of a death was a tenth of a percent. There were no deaths from anticoagulant bleeding, by the way. Now, did, did some patients get a clot in this, in this series? Yes, but nobody died. And that's the important thing. So we, we can say for sure that over 99% of all post-operative clots can be uh, eliminated, fatal clots, using this protocol. Now, let's turn to my own story, which is the whole reason for this video. I'm 82 years old and was in good condition health, a good health, riding my trike 20 miles, three to four days a week until November 2021. And here I am seen riding with my dear friend David in late November. So I developed severe sciatica at that time, and despite cortisone therapy, anti-inflammatory drugs, and eventually several steroid injections resulted in relative immobility over the next several months and walking slowly in severe pain. Also, because of all of the cortisone, I developed adrenal insufficiency. Now, approximately 10 days prior to the acute event, my wife noted uh, as we were sitting there, as we do visiting every night over a cocktail, uh, she said, you're breathing faster than normal. And I sort of looked at that and I, I guess it was denial. I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I see that. I think I'm out of shape. And because I've been going up and down the stairs 10 or 12 times a day, I did notice when I got to the top of the stairs each time that I was a little bit short of breath. And that had never happened to me before. But I, again, I ignored it. 
But on the evening of 221, when I went up the stairs after the after cocktails, I got very short of breath and my pulse rate went up to 118. I told my wife, oh my God, I must be having a, 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 a heart attack, even though I don't have any chest pain. So take me to the hospital, which was five minutes away. Again, that's for all of you in the audience, that is actually stupid. And for, for you to get your wife to take you to the hospital. Suppose you crash in the car. You should call 911 immediately and have them come. And then the situation is under control. But anyway, I never said I was perfect. An EKG in the emergency room. So when I got the emergency room, they said, well, you just have a fast heart rate. Your heart's fine. And all of a sudden it dawned on me and the attending in the, in the, in the uh, ER. Oh my God, you suppose I have a pulmonary embolus? So the CT showed evidence of a, lar a large bilateral emboli and some smaller ones. I've already shown you those pictures before. Here is the bigger one again. Uh, and so these had occurred over a period of time leading up to the event. And the reason that this didn't kill me, uh, I think, was because I was in such good shape. As a matter of fact, my, my dear friend, colleague, and, and physician, Alfonso Tufour, said to me, oh, I'm so happy because as soon as they started giving you the heparin, your pulse rate went down to 85. So your heart accommodated, you accommodated, your cardiovascular system accommodated to this severe insult. And, and uh, that was a very good sign. My ultrasound of the legs was normal as well as a negative workup for cancer. But on abdominal CT, it showed that there was compression of my left iliac vein by both iliac arteries. No definite clot was present, but there was that abnormality, which we'll talk about in just a minute. I did have a past history of a calf vein thrombosis 40 years ago, and now I'm on lifelong anticoagulants, lifelong compression stockings to prevent any swelling and further thrombosis. But now let's talk about the compression. The compression was described, this was first described in 1959 in an article in Phlebology by doctors May and Turner. And they said, and they showed that when uh, the patient in certain cases anatomically, the right iliac artery would cross over top of the left iliac vein and cause a narrowing at the junction with the vena cava. And in my particular, in, in my case, the vein, iliac vein was compressed by both iliac arteries. Here, take a look. See the white dots are the two arteries. This gray area is the vena cava. And this little trickle down here, this is the left iliac vein that's being compressed against the spine because of the, uh, of, of the presence of the iliac arteries. Now, in my case, I probably didn't have this for, from life. This was probably due to degeneration of the spine that's typical in an 80-year-old. Now, here we see a video, and I'm going to show you in a minute. Watch this spot right here, because as the artery contracts, it squishes the vein close. The vein is squished close right here, squished close. You'll see it better in this view when we turn longitudinally, and you can see that every time the artery pulses, that it momentarily uh, squishes on that vein. So that's the, the nature of this problem. So how in the world could a professor who was teaching all of these vascular principles and caring for thousands of thrombosis victims miss the symptoms reflecting his own pulmonary embolus? These stories emphasize the occult nature associated with pulmonary emboli. Some victims are not so lucky when the embolus presents a sudden death. And so the, the slightest symptomatology you get, the anxiety, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of shortness of breath, um, uh, you've got to be very careful. They're very subtle signs of, of sometimes in the right setting of a pulmonary embolus. So you have to know your score. So everybody needs to take their score and validate it with their physician. And so I would like to leave you with this famous saying that came from my dear friend, James Schmidt, who was a, a, a academic dentist who's now passed. And we're going to have a video on the ode to a fallen, fallen Mainer soon on my website. And he said, well, you know, with this risk assessment, you do what you're doing is you're interrogating uh, strangers so that uh, you're performing a thorough history and physical. So they're no longer strangers. Now they're, they're, they're friends. And of course, you'd never treat a stranger without interrogating them. And you never kill a friend because now that you know about those risk factors, you would uh, try to prevent them by giving them the right prophylaxis. Now I'm showing you this because I'm proud to present Sergio Gianzini and his colleagues, Oscar Bottini and Willie Chi, who have this V-Win Foundation. This is enormously popular and successful foundation for spreading 
good information and real good data about these subjects involving venous disease around the world and they come to all five continents and they've adopted this shirt as a sign and a symbol they, they didn't adopt the shirt because it had my picture on it they adopted this shirt and promoted it because it illustrates the principle which we all need to follow and that was we have got to treat everybody as an individual we have to individually analyze all of their risk factors and then once we know them then we can protect them so this is a critical exercise for the prevention of fatal pulmonary emboli. Here is my website. You can go to it on your phone, pad, or, or, or computer. We keep no personal information. You can take your risk assessment. We also give you definitions of each of the risks. You can ask a question, although I won't give you medical advice. I'll send you back to your doctor, but I can answer a question about venous thromboembolism. And then there's the resource center, which has many videos on it, including some beautiful videos uh, uh, a patient story, uh, and then all of the videos I've produced on YouTube are sitting there. You can look at any one of them. And all of the articles on the Caprini score, and there's now really 250, all of the citations are there. The abstracts are there, and the full articles are there in cases where the articles were free. So please pay attention to your risk assessment. Be vigilant about these risks for venous thromboembolism. And it's a great pleasure to be able to be here and tell you my personal story. And all of you have a wonderful and safe day.